My name is Chase Robinson. I'm the interim president of the Graduate Center. And I'd like to welcome you to what promises to be an illuminating evening. This semester's second major event in our year-long exploration of New York's creative economy. Now, as many of you know, the Graduate Center is a Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. It's a center for applied and theoretical research. And it's a platform for performance, conversation, and public debate. As a community of students and scholars committed to the idea that learning is a public good, we regularly offer public programs featuring eminent thinkers, cultural leaders, and distinguished artists addressing some of today's most pressing issues. To that end, we've been delighted to present Cultural Capital, the promise and price of New York's creative economy, an institution wide public programming initiative that is exploring the city's creative and knowledge-based industries through an array of conversations, panel discussions, screenings, and performances. From music and publishing to arts organizations and tech startups, New York has long been vital to the creation and consolidation of the creative economy. And tonight, as we come to the end of our first semester, we pose a foundational question. What are the economics of the creative economy? We've convened a distinguished group to answer that question. First, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Edward Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics at Harvard where he also serves as director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston. Specializing in the economics of cities, including growth, segregation, crime, and housing markets, Professor Glazer has been particularly interested in the role that geographic proximity plays in creating knowledge and innovation. His most recent book is Triumph of the City, How Our Greatest Invention Makes Us Richer, Smarter, greener, healthier, and happier. It's also a pleasure to introduce our own David Harvey, currently a distinguished professor of anthropology here at the Graduate Center. Professor Harvey is an eminent social theorist and author of many highly influential books, such as Social Justice and the City, The Condition of Postmodernity, and Justice, Nature, and the Geography of Difference. His most recent book is Rebel Cities. We're also honored to welcome Seth Pinsky. Mr. Pinsky served as president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation from 2008 to 2013. Appointed by Mayor Bloomberg seven months before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, Mr. Pinsky reevaluated the agency's strategy to position the city as a global center for innovation. He is currently executive vice president at RXR Realty. Finally, it's a pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, David, Adam Davidson. Mr. Davidson is co-founder and co-host of Planet Money, a co-production of NPR and This American Life. He also writes the weekly It's the Economy column for the New York Times Magazine. Mr. Davidson has won several major awards, including the Peabody, DuPont Columbia, and the Polk. He's also written for The Atlantic, Harper's, GQ, and Rolling Stone. Please welcome me in welcoming our distinguished guests. Thank you all so much for coming here. I'm, I'm really thrilled by this panel and, and by the conversation we're gonna have. And um, we thought it would be fun to bring the city into the conversation, so, um, so some CUNY staff went out and filmed parts of the city that sort of represent some of the ideas we're going to talk about. And we're going to show those to you. And the panelists will respond a bit to those and, and, then, um, and then say what they have to say. And I think if everything goes right, I'll have every three of you attacked by the other two at some point <laughs> in the conversation. At least that's my goal. Um, so why don't we start? Let, let, let's bring up the first image, um, which is for me, a major transformation of the city. This is the Google building um, that, that many of you know on, on 8th Avenue. And, and I thought about this uh, 
I remember when it came in. My, uh, I grew up not far from here, and and um, and uh, not far from from the Google building. My dad was sitting in the front row. Jack Davidson was a member of Circle Repertory Theater Company, which was a great, not particularly profitable, uh, off-Broadway theater company, mm. whose offices were in that building when I was a kid. So, um, and 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 so I thought of that building as sort of personifying the Greenwich Village, and I don't think we called it Chelsea at the time, but the, um, the area I grew up in uh, of sort of not terribly financially successful, but creatively uh, exciting nonprofit arts organizations. Google, of course, is, is quite a bit more profitable than, than Circle Repertory Theater Company ever was. And I thought I would sort of talk with the three of you about what does the presence, let, let's talk about that right now, of, of such a, a huge iconic um, company choosing to make New York a major part of its home. And Ed, I'm, I'm guessing that for you this is, your book is called The Triumph of the City. This would be a triumph for, for New York City, is that fair? Well, I think it's an, an indication of the enduring strength of cities, and I think I, I couldn't think of a better example of that than Google. In some sense, we live in an age of paradox, an age in which it is effortless to telecommute across the planet, in which we could all occupy whatever sylvan spot appeals to our biophilia. And so many ways, in so many places, we choose the inconveniences of city life. To me, at least, Google symbolizes that, both in its vast New York presence and also in the Googleplex, because if you think of what company should have been able to do long distance working best in all the world. Surely it should have been Google, right? The company that allows people everywhere to search for things throughout the planet, and yet they don't send their workers home. They don't tell them go work from anywhere. In Silicon Valley, they build the Googleplex, a very famous example of geographic concentration. And, and here in New York, they buy this you know, esteemed building, this former center of the Port Authority, a vast amount of physical space that brings smart people together uh, near one another. And, and at least, I think the ultimate you know, force that explains this is that what globalization and new technologies have done is they've increased the returns to being smart. They've increased the returns to innovation in so many ways, not just the financial returns. Um, and we are a social species. We get smart by being around other smart people. Cities enable us to learn from one another. They ena enable those collaborative chains of creativity that have powered humanity's greatest hits from Athenian philosophy to Facebook. And Google is just taking advantage of that. And that, that to me, is what this, what this symbolizes. Although I, I can't resist the fact that what's so great about this is you not only have this 21st century New York in, in Google here, you have, of course, classic 20th century New York in the, in the era of LaGuardia and FDR and the Port Authority. And then you have, now covered by the, now it appears outside of the thing, the Chase Manhattan Bank, late 18th, early 19th century New York. And of course, the story of how Burr and Hamilton collaborated to essentially bamboozle the city government in order to get, their, uh, get themselves a bank, Burr get himself a, a bank by promising to provide clean water for the city, clean water, which of course never materialized, is symbolized by the Chase Manhattan Bank, which was of course the uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, which was the Chase Manhattan Bank, which was the bank of the Manhattan Water Company. It is of course false, as you will read in Wikipedia, that that, uh, that octagonal logo is the cross section of a water pipe. That's nonsense. Uh, but it, if it helps you to remember the somewhat sordid history of how this bank came about in this, in this political combination of two men who would later, one of whom would later shoot each other on the banks of the Hudson. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a helpful thing. Right, on the New Jersey side. But, yeah, indeed. <laughs> and, and just to help everybody, I'm gonna sort of try and paint your ideological perspectives. Ed, you told me the other day that you're sort of an old school New York Republican, a fairly left on social issues, moderate centrist on economic issues. In other words, you're a member of a party that does not exist. That's right. Yeah, that, that's yeah. right, and um, and proudly so. I I, I wouldn't want to be a part, member of any party that would have me, of course. Uh, but uh, right. So and and remember, in terms of the, I mean, I have like Professor Harvey a deep-seated fear of government, uh, and uh, and also a belief in using what government we have to make the lives of the poor better off. And I think that those are are you know, uh, linchpins of my my ideology. Great. So David, you. Um, you proudly call yourself a, a Marxist and, and, and bring that perspective to many of your writings about, about how cities work. And I'd, I'd first like to just hear you respond, because I, I, I have to say, I, I was fairly familiar with Ed's work. Um, I'm an economics correspondent, which 
I, I don't say this normally, but in America, I think that means I'm a capitalist correspondent. And, and, um, and, and I wasn't familiar with your work, but I found it thrilling to, you have these wonderful videos online uh, of where you walk through um, Marx's Capital, Volumes 1 and 2, and, and, and really enriched my understanding of those books. And then you write very powerfully about cities from a perspective, frankly, that for me was, was utterly new and, and, and really exciting to read about. Oh. And bizarre, really. I mean, very hard to get my head around. Um, and so I, like, I feel like when I read Ed's book, I, I was just going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, yep, yep. And when I read your book, I, what? Where is he going with this? Um, and so I'm finding myself really wondering, what are you going to say about, about th this building? <laughs> How does this make you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm going to say. I, uh, the interesting thing about this building is to think about the labor process that's involved and the activities going on there. What does it make? What does it produce? And it turns out with Google that um, we, the public, actually do the labor. We do it. They don't make anything. They just sit there in that building, and what do they extract from us? They extract rents from us. In other words, this is a totally parasitic form of economic activity. <laughs> That's what you would say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, way back when, about 1957, you probably remember this, Ben Hoselitz wrote this piece, which was about looking Six, at... 67. 67? 67, 67, the, year I, the year I was born. Okay. On this island. Yeah, well, so, yeah. so he, he wrote this piece, and, and he was looking at the American cities, and they were all full of productive stuff. They made steel, they made autos, all this kind of stuff, you know. All the industries we knew that, published, that employed thousands of people, all the unionized labor, all this sort of stuff. And he looked at Latin American cities and said, no, no, you don't see any of that. All you do is see them sort of extracting rents from you know, the rural populations and all the rest of it. So he divided the world into productive cities, which were our cities, and mm. parasitic cities, which were their cities. It's now been totally reversed. New York City is one of the most parasitic economies in the universe, whereas all of the production is plucking taking place in places like Bangladesh, Shenzhen, all the rest of it. And Google is a classic form of new uh, industrial organization, which is not about making anything, as I said. It's really about extracting uh, labor from everybody else who actually contributes all the information that Google then utilizes and sells to everybody else at a profit. Uh, I, you know, I... I uh Oh, you don't Sorry, like that. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I certainly have no interest in, in Google personally and, and am not here as a representative of Google. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I think that actually um, it's, it's a narrow view of what Google does to say that they don't produce anything. Now, they don't produce anything physical, although they actually do produce physical things through some of the subsidiaries that yeah. they own. Right. But um, you know what they have created is... Um, concepts, ideas um, that uh, in turn make people's lives, I, I'll leave aside words like better or worse, but um, easier. Um, and I think you know, the fact that people gravitate towards Google indicates that people actually believe that what they've produced make their lives easier. I mean, people voluntarily use Google because they think it's the best way to find the information that they're looking for. And um, you know, I, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the concept of um, uh, cities that are consumer cities or parasitic cities and cities that are producers. But I think to limit production just to physical um, uh, objects is um, missing a lot of um, what makes this time in our history particularly exciting. But the, tr the trouble with that is that CUNY actually produces all these things. It's just that we just, just haven't figured out uh, Mr. President, we haven't figured out how to extract rents but I don't think that from that, it all. And I, this is the point. I mean, I who, what is, that, what's the most profitable industry right now? It's, 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 it's rent extractions. It's not about actually making things. Yeah, but I mean, steel companies are rent extractors as well. I'm not sure why that's any different from oh, what steel Google companies does. make steel and put it into buildings Google and all the rest of it. Google makes algorithms. Google, Google feels like, I mean, I, I would have thought that you would have launched into an attack on, on J.P. Morgan Chase, which would have felt like very strong ground for attacking, attacking uh, uh, rent seeking. Whereas Google, I mean, I, I guess. Uh, to me, at least, the first thing that I think when I think of Google, Google is just straight gratitude. I mean, do you remember what search engines were like before, before Google? And now they're a lot better. And I feel really grateful to the guys at Google who enabled me to learn stuff oh, I, I more think quickly. That's, I think and that's... you know what else? They've never charged me a penny for it. 
I mean, it's, it's sort of an amazing thing. And, and, uh, no, but they've extracted vast amounts of money from doing exactly what you talk about. And um, we could they, do that for free. Have. We should be doing all of that no, for I'm free. I'm going to interject, because I know we're just minutes away from everyone agreeing on this. But, um, <laughs> but I do want to, we have a bunch of videos. So if we can move forward, because I, I think the, what, what I would be interested in, in talking about a bit, going to the theme of, of the idea of a creative city, I want to just spend a moment defining what we mean by a creative city. Um, this is the equitable building down in, down in Wall Street. And we were sort of joking backstage that Wall Street and finance has become ever more creative over the last yeah, I uh, think, I think, I think, I, I think that when I say it's a parasitic city, I think of this, this city has more creative accountants, more creative tax lawyers, more, t you know, I mean, it is the most creative place in the world for almost every fetishistic desire that can actually be constructed. And so I, I'm, you know, I mean, I think that is the center of what the creativity is about. The people who came up with, uh, you know, collateralized debt obligations and got us into the foreclosure crisis. That would be J.P. Morgan. Again. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's that, that's the creative side. And again, it's about it's about dispossessing people of of their own value. It really is. It's an economy of dispossession, not an economy of making. And that is the problem I have. So when I. Um when I first hear the phrase creative cities, I, um, I grew up in West Beth, which is all artists in Greenwich Village. Um, and, and as a friend of mine said, you had to be a bad artist to live there because you had to meet min you know, a maximum income threshold. They're not bad artists. They're wonderful artists, but they're not, um, they're not all wonderful. But they're um, not high earn. They weren't, at least when you, you come into the building, you're not high earning artists. And, and it was a building and a culture I grew up in, in in New York in the 70s, like the Google building once was, of, of uh, not particularly profitable creative enterprises that really were self-consciously creative, theaters, dance, um, painting, et cetera. Um, but when I read ed, economists, they define creative cities differently. There's Richard Florida, the sort of, I don't know if he coined the phrase creative economy, but he certainly made himself synonymous creative with class. it. Huh? The creative the class. The creative class. And, and he expands it quite a bit to just, I think it's all of your parasites. It's anybody who doesn't physically make something. It's, he expands it, I believe, to lawyers and accountants. Ed, how do you, what is a creative city? What, what, what do you, how do you think about that phrase? You know, I, I think about cities, about density is coming from the desire to eliminate transportation costs for goods, for people, and for ideas. That's how I think about it. And when I think about creativity, I think about it as being one of the byproducts of reducing the cost of moving ideas readily across space. It's, it's the combination of new ideas, of old ideas into new ideas, as Jane Jacobs talked about it. I don't think it's it's very helpful. I don't think it's a very helpful term. And in fact, I, I in my book review of Rich's book, whatever it is, 15 years ago, I pointed out that the one, the one fact that was well known, and someone remembers being in the car when I told Richard about it, uh, the one fact that was well known was that the share of the population with college degrees in a city was a very strong predictor of which cities managed to come back. That's, that's the fundamental fact, and certainly education has been the bedrock uh, on which cities have, have thrived in the US and elsewhere in the past 20 or 30 years. I think trying to pin down which well-educated person is more creative versus less creative, I'm not sure that that's a very productive activity on some level. In some level, in fact, the question of who's parasitic and who isn't is more, is more relevant. And, and there I think, yeah, I think it is a complete mistake to confuse making stuff that's physical with being versus not with being parasitic or not. I, 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 you know, no matter how widespread you think paras parasitism is, I would resist the urge to connect physical productivity with, with you know, be, not being a parasite, but. Um. Now, Seth, you, you, when you worked for the city, I, do you, we don't have to have exact numbers, but broadly speaking, I, I've heard people say the economy of the city is Wall Street, that, that the rest of the city is a byproduct of Wall Street, but then I've heard other people tell me, no, no, it's the diversity, it's that we have publishing and insurance and, and real estate and all these other, um, you know, and fashion and et cetera. What, what, how do we think of, you know, Wall Street, how do we think about um, these other fields as, as providing the economy of the well, city? Well, one of the, the challenges that the city has faced over the last several decades is um, that on the one hand, um, we had continued to have one of the most well-diversified economies um, in the world. Uh, if you look at the number of industries, for example, in New York City that employ at least 100,000 people, it's, uh, I think, 10, 12, something in that neighborhood. You're not going to find that in, in most other major cities. Um, but even with all of that diversification, there had been for 
quite some time a first among equals. Um, and that first was clearly um, Wall Street, and to a certain extent continues to be Wall Street. Um, again, my statistics may be off by a couple of percentages, but at the height of the last boom in 2007, Wall Street accounted for um, somewhere around eight or nine percent of um, all private sector jobs um, in New York City, but accounted for something like 34 percent of all private sector earnings in the city. In 2007, 43% of the payroll in the island of Manhattan was in finance and insurance. That's a, that's a, that's a hard fact. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the numbers I gave for citywide yeah, that's, are that's also a, yeah. um, correct. So um, in many ways, the city's economy was being driven by Wall Street. And one of the things that Mayor Bloomberg um, observed when he came into office was that um, for the long-term health of the city, this is problematic. First of all, um, you know, you're not hedging your bets. You're, you're heavily reliant on one particular industry. If that industry runs into problems, as it ultimately did, um, then that means the entire city will, will run into problems as well. Second of all, um, Wall Street itself, uh, if it is going to be the one industry that you're betting on, is a highly cyclical industry. Um, and so when Wall Street uh, would cough, the city would catch a cold. And uh, one of the things that, that we worked very hard at in the Bloomberg administration, and I think that we um, achieved a certain degree of success in, um, was seeking to try to, uh, to hedge those bets. And what that meant wasn't necessarily shrinking Wall Street, although um, that is, in fact, um, what has happened, although not as much as I think people might have predicted in 2008. Um, but it's more about growing other parts of the economy more rapidly. Um, and one of the areas um, where we believe that there was a real opportunity was in this, what we referred to, and I think this is actually a more helpful term than creative economy, the innovation economy. Um, and that spans um, the creative economy, but it also includes things like technology, um, all of which has been growing very rapidly in the city um, and has allowed us, even with um, the, the relative um, decline in Wall Street in recent years, um, to weather that storm and to continue to grow as a city, to continue to produce jobs. And that's very important for our future. And I, I want to get to the innovation economy next, but I, David, I, I'd be curious. I, I also was surprised by talking about Google as a rent seeker. And quickly, for those who don't know that term, I didn't know that term, rent to economists is not what you pay every month. It's sort of you can make money by actually providing you know, productive, valuable goods and services that someone else wants and gladly pays for, or you can um, extract rents, which is basically by dint of your power or just controlling land or having political power, you can basically steal or take money from others who aren't happy. And a, a friend of mine defined rents as, if the guy's rich and you're glad he's rich, then that's not rent seeking. If he's rich and you're mad at him, then it's rent seeking. <laughs> and he actually used the Google um, guys as an example of, I'm glad they're rich because my life is better and I see that. So I was surprised also, David, that, that you felt that way because I think something I know that I don't know that everyone knows is that you can get a very broad, far left, far right, center left, center right consensus among economists and economically minded thinkers that Wall Street is at least to some degree a rent seeker. And I think, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a large percentage of even you know, right of center Mitt Romney voting um, Republican economists would say, yeah, they're major rent seekers. I think you could find virtually no capitalist economists who would say that of Google. So, so I, do you differentiate between Wall Street and Google, or do, are they of the same ilk? No, they're not of the same ilk, but uh, they're, they're both rent seekers from a different, in the same way there's a difference between people who get rents out of the property market and out of speculation and you know, housing and all the rest of it. So you could, but let me, let me backtrack a little bit. I mean, we live in a capitalist city. And one of the features of capitalism that I think is absolutely fundamental is what Joseph Schumpeter called creative destruction. So I'm not against talking about what's getting created, but I think it's terribly important also to talk about what is getting destroyed. And I think it's also terribly important to talk about who benefits from what gets created and who gets hurt by what gets destroyed. And if you could look at the Wall Street thing and say, okay, Wall Street benefited from a whole bunch of things that were going on in the 1990s right now. How many people lost their houses? What got destroyed in the foreclosure wave? And that affected this city. I mean, there's foreclosures out in Brooklyn and everywhere else. I mean, so, so you, see, you see 
rent, the rent seekers are sucking it up in Wall Street and people are losing their houses in Brooklyn. And you kind of say, well, I can't actually draw a line, if you like, from one to the other and say, there, see that flow of money from there to there. But if one group in the population is losing catastrophically and the other group in the population is winning very, very well, then you've, you've, got, you've got something uh, inferentially, you kind of say, there's some relationship here between what's going on. So the creative destruction that goes on in a capitalist city is, I think, a terribly important thing to an analyze. And from my perspective, that's where you start. And, and, and for me, uh, it, it, it's fairly plain that in, 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 in this city, you know, there is a certain creativity which is there. And yeah, it's imaginative, and some people do benefit for it. And in fact, the benefit can be very, very extensive. My point about Google was, that, yeah, the benefit is extensive, but notice that we are all actually, you say you're not exploited, but in fact, Google is exploiting all of the things, all the information we give it. It's a, it, it sucks up all of the information we provide it, and it uses that information, which it then you know, passes on and sells to others. So that it's our labor that actually goes into producing what is constructive and productive uh, in Google, and they're the ones who simply then take it and actually gain rents off it. I mean, that's, my, that's why I call it a rent seeker. So the creative destruction that goes on in the city is in incredibly significant. And we look at you know, the production of homelessness in the city. We look at the production of gentrified neighborhoods. We look at all of those issues. We look at what, the, the negative stuff that's going on in education. We look at how much the city put into actually uh, uh, helping build the high line, which is OK, good in lots of ways. And you can be very, you feel very good about it. But then you kind of say, that amount of money put in the schools that would be much better. I mean, this is the sort of thing that's being fought for in Brazil right now. I mean, it's amazing. There's this country that's soccer mad, and it's going up the wall about the spending of all this money on soccer stadiums. Why? Because they see all this money being spent on soccer stadiums, which is benefiting, what, FIFA and, and the production interests, and it's not going into schools and hospitals, and it's not going into those areas where it's really needed. So for me, it's very important to look at this analysis. Yeah, but, but you know, we I, found I, a common cause fighting against sports stadiums. Yeah. This is yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I, 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 hey, hey, you, hey, you just like you, you just go to the barricades. You just uh, you, you like <laughs> suburbs too, yeah. actually. So we're both on the same page on yeah. suburbs, you know. Yeah. So. But, but you know, uh, you, you made a, a number of points, um, and I, I won't address all of them. But just to use the High Line by way of example. Um, the city invested a substantial amount of money in the High Line, 125 or so million dollars. Um, within the first few years of that, there was $2 billion in private capital that was invested um, yeah. in that area that I can assure you would not have been invested there had the High Line not been built. That $2 billion in private investment in turn is taxed by the city and allows the city to put significantly more money into all of the things that you are describing as being important. And by the way, it's not an either or proposition. At the same time that the city was investing in parks like the High Line, uh, creating more acreage of open space, which by the way benefits people throughout the city um, than any administration in half a century at least, the city was also putting record amounts of money back into its public school system. If you look at the amount that the city was spending um, both to increase operating funding and also capital investments, um, it reached levels that we've never seen um, in the history of the city. Um, we have to do all of these things. In order for New York to be successful, we absolutely need to invest in education at all levels of education. There's no question about that. But we also need to create the kinds of amenities that attract people to the city, um, that make the city a livable place, um, that bring the creators to the city who create companies, um, who uh, work in companies and who make our businesses competitive, which allows our economy to thrive, which in turn allows our city to tax those businesses and to pay for all the things that all of us agree are important as social goods. And so what's happened to prices, uh, property you know, prices around the high line? Who's benefited well, from Well, but you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, again, uh, first of all, um, the taxation uh, is spread throughout the city. Um, that, that is one of the advantages that a government has, is it can take benefits that accrue in a certain part of a geography and make sure that that money then gets spread uh, more widely. And um, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, but second of all, it's also important to keep in mind that um, affordability is definitely an issue in New York City. There's no question about it. But it's also a symptom of the city's success. The reason why affordability is such an issue in New York 
is a simple matter of supply and demand. It's because we have more people who want to be here because we've made those investments in the city and we've made the city an attractive place, then we have capacity to house those people. And if you actually remember to the last time that affordability wasn't a major issue in the city, it was um, when the city was doing very poorly. Um, and the easiest way to address the affordability issue for us is to make the city less desirable. Um, now, clearly, that's not the only way to address affordability. Um, but we should remember that the reason why we have this affordability issue is because we've been successful as a city. Just, just to follow on that, I, I don't want to lose the Wall Street thread, which I think also connects to this. There are really two separate Wall Street questions, one of which is Wall Street within the nation as a whole. And there, I don't think there's any sensible economist who doesn't believe there are huge issues, huge issues with the way that, that our public policies work towards Wall Street. It's a problem because we do actually think most of us, we're not, not Marxists, do actually believe that you need some degree of, no, I didn't mean that. I, I believe that you need some sort of private allocation of capital to, to, to put stuff in, in decent hands. On the other hand, the track record of private allocation of, of capital is so deeply troubling that, that this current situation is not at all palatable to any of us. It is worth emphasizing that in some sense, the debacle of 2007, 2008 was because Wall Street did what policymakers asked of it above all, which was to make cheap credit available to everyone, right? However, the downside of that is you make cheap credit available to everyone, they buy things they can't afford, and as a result, you end up in a catastrophic situation. We have not solved this problem, Dodd-Frank has not solved this problem, but this problem is also not New York's problem, despite the prevalence of, of Wall Street here, because financial market regulation is really not best done out of City Hall. It's really something that needs to be, needs sensible Washington-based Washington, uh, legislation to, to handle Global. that. Global. Global, indeed. Um, at the local level, there are it's hard on one level, right, this massive cash producing thing is the engine that brought New York back in some level. It provided the money that paid for all those, all those social services that the city provided. On the other hand, it is also the thing that pushed up property values, right? So both of those things are going on. So for a local level, you should, you know, be cheering for Wall Street is what you hope for is greater tax revenues and a greater abundance of, of cash, and you should be jeering if you'd rather having a, have a city that was much more affordable because there was much less demand for its, for its space. Could we, let's go to Dumbo now, because um, I think that's actually a natural place to go, uh, which is our next stop on the chain. And um, this is just a random corner in Dumbo. We assume that that building's filled with exciting co-locational um, <laughs> um, entrepreneurial um, incubators. And I, so I grew up, the building I grew up in, West Beth, the High Line used to end there. And, and I, I used to sneak onto the tracks when it was just a, a really ratty old um, train track. And, and I love that the High Line. And I love what's become of it. And I can't afford to live there in my wildest dreams in that neighborhood. And, but I'll tell you, I feel OK about that. I feel like I, I miss the Greenwich Village of my childhood. But now that's a bunch of hedge fund people or whoever can afford to live there, and my dad and artist um, protected housing, um, who, uh, and uh, one little isolated corner. Um, but then there's Dumbo, and, and now maybe Dumbo's too rich, but there's um, Bushwick, and, and there's other places. And, and I, I personally, I like the New York that is constantly evolving in this way, um, and that from my reading of history has been happening from the beginning of New York, where there are these pockets, you know, these kind of Jane Jacobsian pockets of, of the right mix of, of walkable streets and, and old buildings that become the, the latest frontier of artists and entrepreneurs and, and new thinkers, and then those move on to the next place. And, and I have to say, even, even though I personally would love to live in the neighborhood I grew up in, I, I find it hard to be mad about it. Um, help, help me be mad about it. You need it. a little outrage. That's yeah, what yeah I need a little outrage, yeah. <laughs> I'm mad about plenty. It's just that particular <laughs> thing. Yeah. Well, well, I, you know, I go back to Seth's point. I mean, yeah, the city's been successful, but successful in what dimension? Uh, it's it's done a wonderful job of creating, if you like, an almost golden gated community of Manhattan, in which uh, you know Russian billionaires and Saudi billionaires want to have penthouses, which which are going to live in for about two weeks a year. I mean. Yeah, I mean, this is great. I mean, this is, and this is where a lot of capital comes because it's safe, you know. I mean, this is probably the last place you'll ever see a revolution, except if I have my way, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and as, you know. So I, I, I think, uh, yeah, it's been successful in certain ways, but it's been successful 
in, in dealing with that. It has not been successful in, in, for example, really pursuing the question of affordable housing, really taking up the question of homelessness, of really dealing with the fact that many people are being forced out of proximity to their employment opportunities by having to live way, way out. Uh, and, and, you know, I came into Kennedy Airport the other morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I get on the E-train, and it's packed. It's packed with women of color who are coming into the city to wake the place up. They're living way out there. That's the only place they can afford to live. And, and so, but that is, is, is if you like, a, uh, something, not the, the city's not entirely responsible for this. I mean, this is what happens when, when rental prices start to do their work, which is starting to force things up. But this is actually something that is not unique to New York. Almost every city I know in the world has a property boom going on, and prices are just sailing through the roof. I mean, it is impossible in, I mean, Sao Paulo actually brags right now that it's more expensive property-wise than New York City. And you kind of say, when cities start to brag about how successful they are, by how big, the, how far up the property prices have gone, you know, people in the, 50% the of the population in New York, as I read it, live and try to live on less than $30,000 a year. Whereas the top 1% on average is, is, is earning something like $3.57 million a year. And we have a, we have a city which is great and very successful for those, those people. But it's not so successful for all those people who are living on you know, less than $30,000 less than $30, a year. And, and so you, you know, when, you, when you start to talk about a success, you have to talk again about it again in terms of creative destruction. Who's really, who, who's really measuring this? <coughs> what is it they're getting? It, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and, 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 and what's happening to everybody else? I mean, this is, this is the kind of thing that I think we should think about in the city. And instead of bragging, you know, having bragging rights about, well, we, we've done this, we've done that, look at the situation more, more, more broadly and ask about, well, is this a good city? Uh, not only for, for, for the millionaires, is it a good, billionaires, is it a, is it a good city uh, for, the, for people living on $10,000, 20000 $30,000 a year? The, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, there, there is no question that um, there has been and remains an issue with poverty in New York City. No question about that. There is no question that there is a growing issue with affordability in New York City. There's no question about that. But I think to say um, that New York has not in the face of global pressures, um, and I think you are right about that, that these are the sorts of phenomena that you're seeing in cities all around the world, that New York has not actually done something to try to address these issues is not fair. Um, you know, the, the mayor had a seven and a half billion dollar program to create affordable housing in the city, uh, by far the most aggressive affordable housing program anywhere in the United States. Um, and is actually leaving office very close to achieving the, the goal of creating or preserving the 165,000 units of affordable housing that, that he promised. Um, you also have the fact that um, uh, at the same time that poverty has actually gone up in the United States, um, uh, poverty has actually remained the same in New York City, which is not something to, to say we're done about, but certainly relative to the rest of the country is something that I think is important to observe. It's also important to observe that um, among, I think it's the top 15 cities in the United States, um, when the mayor came into office in 2002, uh, New York uh, was, had the sixth highest poverty rate. Uh, now New York has the 13th highest poverty rate. So comparing it to other cities and the performance of those other cities, New York has actually done a better job. Uh, again, not addressing the problem, not solving the problem, but relative to the comparable cities, I think it's, it's very important to understand that in a context like this, um, that uh, there's a lot that we can do, but there's also a lot that we can't do. And it's, it's not really fair to compare the performance of the city against a utopia. Um, you have to compare the city against the reality. Seth, I, I, wanna, I wanna both both agree with you, actually, and I think on, on one level, I think unquestionably the view of the Bloomberg administration as being a plutocrat's paradise that, didn't, that wasn't committed to you know, doing as much as it could for social issues, I think is just wrong. I mean, it, was it was a plutocrat was, who was committed. Who was, who was committed, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's just, as soon as he got on that plane to Bermuda, that went <laughs> in, in a, uh, um, but on the other hand, I wanna push back on the notion that, that, the poverty, that the stability of the poverty rate is necessarily a good thing. And this is a, this is a central point and, about- And just about, to be clear, yeah, it's right, not yeah. a good thing. It's, 
it's, it's a less bad thing. Well, I'm not sure, right? Because the, the, the key here is that poverty, uh, urban poverty is not the same thing as national poverty or global poverty, because urban poverty reflects the location decisions of the poor. And this is a point I make over and over again, that cities often should not in any sense be ashamed of their poor people, because in fact, cities don't make people poor, at least not usually. Cities attract poor people with the promise of economic, uh, economic opportunity, often is in the case of New York with a much more robust social safety net, with public transportation. My own research on this area shows that poverty rates go up near new subway stops. This doesn't mean that those subway stops are impoverishing the local residents. It means that the subway, subways are actually attracting poor people who can get around without the ability to, uh, to own a car. You want to know a place that has no poverty? The, the completely homogeneous suburb in which I will go home tonight, right? which it should be profoundly ashamed of. Right? Because, in fact, it has made sure that there is no, you know, there, there's no way that you can build homes for the poor. There's no access for public transportation that's, that's meaningful. Right? So, in fact, the poverty rate of a local area is a very weak measure because often poverty rates go up because good things are happening to the poor, as in the case of building subway stations, or they go down because bad things are happening to the poor, like they're being priced out. Of, of a local market. Now, I certainly worry a lot about the poor in New York, but if you were going to ask me, the, sort of the real missing group is, not the, is, is actually the middle. That actually, New York has a lot of things that it offers for people with lower income, like the ability to get around without a car for every adult, like the ability to uh, access better social services, like the you know, rich fabric of ethnic neighborhoods that have sustained the city for centuries. But what it does not do is provide reasonably priced income for housing for people who don't naturally get into low income housing. What it doesn't provide is you know, widespread, uh, widespread high quality public schooling at the high school level. What it doesn't provide is those ordinary things that middle income Americans take, take for granted. In some sense, that's, that's the great, uh, to me at least, that's, that missing middle is what troubles me most. And about David, the before you respond, can we go to the next image? Because I think this will provoke your, um, the conversation. This, will, this is actually, I think, the building that you mentioned, the, 157, the, this new, I think, un, the most expensive building in the world until the <laughs> next one on Park <laughs> Avenue is built. It was, uh, I think you have the 78th yeah. floor, is that right, David? <laughs> yeah. um, but the, the, according to the New York Times, and I just wrote a column about this last week that Ed appeared in, that um, the first nine tenants were all billionaires, at least half of whom, like you said, will visit a few times um, a year. Um, but it made me think, as, as Ed just said, David, that New York's inequality is a global phenomenon. If, if yeah. you're a city where Russian oligarchs and Yemeni peasants both come to the city, um, I, what, what can a mayor do um, other than, like Seth said, Yeah, let, 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 me, let me make clear. I, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't particularly want to go after the Bloomberg administration because I think uh, any municipal government has a limited possibility of doing anything, and I think has a, you know, just personally think that the Bloomberg administration has a mixed record. It did some good things, but did some not such good things. Um, but what do you do about the fact that in, say, 2007 or somewhere around there, about 10% of the rental housing stock in, in New York City was taken over by private equity companies? And what were they doing? They were playing inflated prices with the idea that they could actually take uh, rent-stabilized uh, kind of apartments and turn them market rents. I mean, what was Tishman doing down in, in that disaster, at, you know, uh, Stuyvesant Town and, and, and you know, Cooper yeah, Village? I mean, I, it, it, this, this kind of raiding of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the assets of the city by private capital uh, are as serious a problem, far more serious a problem, actually, to me, than, than whether the Bloomberg administration did this or did that. And, and yeah, it's a global problem. I mean, and, and it's a global problem because right now, capital can't think of anything productive to do. It's profitability in, 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 in so it's going after rents. It's doing it on intellectual property rights, it's doing it in, in housing, and it's doing it in, in land, and there's a land grab going on right throughout Latin America and, and everything. So yeah, New York City is, is situated in a global economy where actually capital doesn't know what to do except to be a rent seeker as opposed to actually going investing and making something. I mean, this is a gross generalization, and you'll always find a few, obviously some things are different, but that, that's, that's, that's essentially what, what's been happening. And those people who are managing that flow of capital, which is, which is Wall Street and London and all the rest of it, are actually chances looking for, is there some place we can go to do this? So when they supported 
what happened uh, down in uh, Stuyvesant Town and so on. They were, they were, what, what, did, what did they offer? They offered something like $5.7 billion, and at the end of the day it was worth $1.4. You, you tell me the, the, the details. Well, I, I mean, have, have any of the rents been converted, though? Has, 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 has any of no, it that is actually the reason why they ended up losing the property was because was the courts protected. Yeah, protect 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 well, the courts were going to protect them. Well, but they have other ways, of, as you know, of, of getting renters out of places. Big, when big capital gets in there, they know, they know how to, how to manage it. But, but with that huge raid on the rental stock, it, it forced prices up pretty much everywhere. Uh, several of the, of, of, of the private equity companies went bankrupt. They were supported by one of the New York community banks and, and so on. So there's a, there's, there's the, there are these processes going on in the city which uh, the mayor is not really able to do anything about. And so I, like, I'm, I'm not going to blame you and I'm not going to blame the mayor for everything. So you're off the hook, okay? But, <laughs> but <laughs> well, can we talk about time. policy responses? Because um, yeah. what... what Short of, or, or not short of, of, of a revolution, what what can be done to, um, and and what is the goal actually? What 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 would be the the, the city? What is my goal, or yeah, what is yeah. the goal? <laughs> what is your goal? Right? Uh, of of, what would the city of New York look well, like? I, that, well, I think first off, first off, uh, the only bankers that have been put in jail are in Iceland. And uh, maybe we should take a few bankers and ship them to Iceland and put them in jail. That would be a good idea. I mean, seriously. I mean, seriously. I mean, I mean it's all very well having, I don't know, $13 billion or something like that taken out of J.P. Morgan or whatever. You know. It's all very well doing that, but actually that's a hit on the shareholders. The people who are personally involved in it have got away with absolutely, you know, ripping off people around the world at a huge rate often through illegal practices and predatory practices, and, and, and there's no accountability on that at all. So one of the things to do would be... You Although know, I don't know that, that that helps your E-train well, writing. Uh, it, no, it does to some degree, because... It'll make them feel really good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah they'll be happy in the morning instead of looking miserable as they did. Uh, you know, I, I think there are, there are a whole set of things. I mean, but it, I think there has to be tremendous curbs on, on speculative activity. The speculative activity going on in property markets right now is, is, a, is a ruinous practice. And, and what's interesting to me is that after the crash in the housing market, you would have thought that would have, you know, people have shrunk back from it, but it's actually resuming. I mean, property prices in New York City right now are sort of going up Would you up have a lot that you can only buy if you're going to live in the house, something like that? Or well, there are, there are... Speculation, of course, is always what yeah. the other guy's doing. I'm doing clever investments. Prudent investments. Yeah. Well, there are, there are ways of organizing taxation and, and, and the like to, to be able to, to deal, deal with some of this. And, and putting curbs on, you know, on what's happening in, in property markets. I mean, the Chinese, by the way, have this problem. I mean, they, they, they're, they're trying to manage a property boom. And but they can hide the data better. Yes, mm -hmm. right. No, they, 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 they can. And they don't necessarily do a better job, by the way. So, but but it, 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 it's a very, it, you know, to me, it's a, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things that need to be, to be looked at and taken care of. I mean, I'm personally of the view that when it comes to something like housing, housing should not be actually... Uh, Furnished as a commodity, it should be a human right. And but a human any right, house should be a human yes, right. yeah, it should be a human right to decent housing and a decent living environment. Full stop. In the same way, there should be a, a, a human right to a decent education but, but for anywhere, everybody. But, but his question was anywhere on yes. Fifth Avenue. Y yes, anywhere. Anyone, anywhere. everyone should have a right to a house on Fifth Avenue. No. Well, I wouldn't mind <laughs> <laughs> taking it over. I mean, yeah, I mean, well, there should be a lottery, you know. I mean, there should be a lottery as to which house you live in or something like that. I mean, I'm fantasizing now, but that's, that's okay. But the, the, the thing is that the, what we've done is we've been told that the only way in which we can get the use value of, as I call it, of housing and of health care and of education is to let the market provide it because it's more efficient at providing the use values than other, some other system. Well, that turns out to be, you know, a, a very dubious story when we look at what's happened in, in housing markets. A very dubious story. The, the exchange value system works extremely well for certain groups in the population, but it doesn't work at all well for other groups in the population. And so we, we, when we ration uh, the, the, the housing possibilities of whole populations through a market mechanism, you actually introduce tremendous inequalities into the into a city and into a society. Now, Ed, your your book is, I'd say, a healthy chunk of it is basically arguing that many policies, well-meaning maybe, 
to, to make cities more equitable actually make them less equitable? Can you sort of fantasize about your ideal city? I'm guessing rent control, rent stabilization won't be a big part of it. Yeah, although I certainly you know see a healthy role for housing for housing vouchers, and I have certainly been convinced that there are advantages to certain types of inclusionary zoning. Although I think it's it's you know a tool that needs to be used warily. Um, you know, I, I, I think Seth said it exactly correctly. I, I you know I think prices reflect the combination of supply and demand, and you know you can't have cheap housing unless you either have low demand or abundant supply. Now, you can create a small number, and that's exactly the lottery point that, that was made earlier. You can create a small number of low-cost homes in an area. Right, that we are do have them. That are we do have them, and you, you get them in various ways. Either you're, you're born into a rent-controlled apartment or you're lotteried in in some way. And uh, you know there are arguments about this one way or the other about why we want to take care of the, uh, a favored group of the poor but not create these benefits more, more widely. But if you want to create widespread affordable housing, there's no real way to do it other than building more. Um, and certainly that's always been my stance within, uh, within New York. Now, the reason why I don't like 157 is that in this, fact this, this thing the, is that it you know, shows a building reaching to the sky, which is something that I'm typically in favor of as having more height, but it does precious little to actually deliver a large number of, of units to large numbers of people. You know, I am perfectly comfortable making the argument that a large-scale apartment building in a Tony area of New York actually does preserve affordability in Queens or in the Bronx by alleviating some of the pressure to gentrify. I think that's absolutely true. But look, this doesn't alleviate much pressure for anybody to gentrify. These guys were not about to go about gentrifying some area in outlying, in outlying Queens. This is, this is you know, defensible as architecture, perhaps defensible as, as property revenues for, for New York, but it's not, it's not fundamentally what the reason why I advocate for allowing more building, for reducing the restrictions on, on construction, which is because I believe that those things, by creating more supply, will make life more livable, more affordable for ordinary income New Yorkers, and will make the city a more inclusive, inclusive city. And Seth, if I'm not mistaken, they got a pretty sweet tax deal where they don't yeah, have to they, pay. Uh, <laughs> they, were, uh, they, they did well in Albany. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, there, there's also- um, Can you explain what they got in Albany, or in rough no, terms? Not, As I remember, they, they got a 10-year, not a full tax abatement, but a, they pay a tiny, tiny fraction. Yeah, of this tax. building was essentially grandfathered into a law that was supposed to have expired, um, and uh, the the building was um, entitled to uh, a long, a fairly long term tax abatement um, uh, for in exchange for the creation of a relatively small number of affordable units offsite, uh, um, and uh, you know that that. That kind of gerrymandering um, of uh, uh, of the tax uh, of the, the city's tax base is, is definitely a problem, and actually a That's bigger rent problem. seeking by everyone. Yeah, no, and, and actually a bigger problem um, with buildings like this, actually citywide, is the way that our property tax system works. Um, uh, the way that our property tax system works, um, high-end co-ops and condos actually pay a proportionately very small percentage of the total real estate taxes in the city. Um, in fact, if you look on a per square foot basis, the, the property tax that a lot of people on Fifth Avenue uh, in your apartment um, uh, or on Park Avenue pay um, is lower than uh, what people in poorer neighborhoods uh, just a, a mile or two away in places like Harlem or, or the South Bronx are paying. Um, there are huge inequities in that and also a missed opportunity because um, you know, you could make the argument that having billionaires um, in a city is good because you can tax the billionaires, but the fact is if the billionaires aren't living in their apartment, the only way you're taxing them is through property tax. And if you're under taxing their apartments, you're not even getting that benefit. Um, so I, I actually think that this is something that I hope that the well, next The city would be better off if that was a bunch of poor people living in that property. They'd be paying from a, from a tax perspective, from a tax yes. Perspective. Um, but, but I think that I, I certainly hope that the next administration looks at some of the inequities in um, the way our property taxes are collected um, and uh, tries to address those inequities for the benefit of the whole city. It is insane. I just want to, just want to be, have, make it clear how much I agree with that, that the New York's, New York's property tax system is just absolutely insane, and famously so. And we ought to look into alternative uh, property rights, like limited equity co-ops and things like that. I mean, I think there's a, there are on the books legal systems which are actually capable of uh, providing uh, 
affordable housing for a prolonged period of time. And I think if uh, the city government actually supports the pro procuring of the land and, 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 actually, and, and, and of, the, of the properties, uh, we could go a long way to actually changing the property rights structure within the city as opposed to, you know, there are many, there's many possibilities there which remain unexplored. Let's, let's move on um, to the next one, which is the, the Bowery Hotel. Um, and, and this is another example of, so when I was a kid, I was really scared of this block. This was where CBGB's was. This is where when people with a mohawk really scared you, it wasn't a cute thing that six-year-olds have. It, was, <laughs> it meant those people are doing serious drugs and they might take my wallet. And, um, and that block in particular was terrifying to me. And I, I did want to, just raise this broad issue of, I was born in 1970, I grew up in a really scary New York, and I have a two-year-old who's growing up in and a And by really the way, a much more affordable New York City also. A much yeah. more affordable New York City, true, although my parents never bought anything living in Greenwich Village since 1963, but. Um, so, um, the, and my two-year-old, I feel like is growing up in a much better city. I like him growing up in a safer city. I like him growing up in a city that still feels vibrant culturally, um, even if he and I can't afford to live in the neighborhood I grew up in. And, and this block, I feel profound mixed feelings about this block. I, I, I kind of like that it's nice now. There's that fancy Bowery Hotel, and there's nice restaurants there, and, and, and it's still a place where people are using the streets, um, and they're not scary junkies. And, um, and I also do, I have to admit, feel pangs of, of missing that old gritty New York that I grew up in. But I just wanted to raise this issue of, of crime and prosperity because, David, I am going to say, as someone who, I think you've lived here almost as long as I have, no, right? No, no, no. When did you move to the, in the 80s? Uh, you moved no, here? no, I moved here in uh, 2001. Oh, I'm way off on your biography, sorry. Um, the, the city, I don't, I can't buy any story other than even for poor people, even in poor neighborhoods, this is a better city to live in. That the, it's a safer city, there's more opportunity. There's a reason that if you count immigrants and their at-home children, half the people in New York City chose to come to the city. They weren't, they weren't, this isn't Appalachia or New Orleans before Katrina where you have centuries of embedded poverty without escape. This is, as, as Ed was saying, poverty coming here. So I, ju I just wanted to raise this issue of, of a crime and, 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 and prosperity in a city and, and as a public amenity. Shoot me down, make me, make me. What, no, well, I, I mean, I, I've known New York City on it. I knew it quite well in the 1960s, um, and I knew it some in the 70s. Um, actually, I know a lot of people who are very nostalgic about the 70s, extremely nostalgic for exactly the reasons you point out, that they could live down in Soho, and, and uh, actually I've met a lot of people who live down there and no rent at all. Uh, because uh, some of the owners preferred to have somebody living there than nobody living there at all. So that was uh, kind of a, a great place. And of course, uh, that was a time when it was culturally very creative. I mean, where did punk rock come from? And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that uh, came out of uh, that because people could, uh, could, live, uh, could, could live in the city. Now, if you're an aspiring artist, where do you go? Bushwick. Yeah, yeah, well, right. and actually, I, I, would, uh, what's wrong with I, I think this is a real but, problem. Well, but I, I, would, I would jump in. I mean, you know, the, the people that you're describing lived in Soho. The people that you're describing would never have lived in Bushwick. No. Um, and the reason for that was because it wasn't safe. Um, and I, I actually think that, that one of the great revolutions in the city, um, with respect to affordability, actually, is um, the revolution in public safety here, that the, the great safety valve that has been created within the five boroughs is the fact that um, whereas in the past, if you were priced out of certain parts of New York um, and uh, you wanted to live decently um, and affordably, your only choice was to leave. Um, and that today, what we've seen is that neighborhood after neighborhood, including many neighborhoods that were literally abandoned, um, where very few people lived, have been revived because it's possible now to move to those places and live there safely. Um, and, um, you know, to the extent that people have been priced out of the East Village, um, 
uh, which they have been. And look, I have the same nostalgia that a lot, a lot of people have. I, I think there was something very exciting about New York in the 1970s. Um, but the people who were priced out of East Village had an option other than leaving. They, they could move to Williamsburg. And as Williamsburg has become more expensive, they move farther east in Williamsburg. And now they're moving into Bushwick. And, and the, eventually, they can move into, into Ridgewood. And, and all of those things are happening because the city is a safer place. Um, and um, the reason why we still uh, remain, I think, a vibrant cultural mecca in New York is because uh, these neighborhoods um, exist and because people have options. And I, I really think, actually, that public safety has been the most important thing in making them an option. Great, great cities are archipelagos of neighborhood that are uh, neighborhoods that are constantly in flux. Right. This is a great thing about New York, that people have options. The exact locations that, that deliver different things change over time. But uh, this, is a, this is a triumph. And, and public safety is absolutely critical. Now, I would have said the right left-wing argument against public safety, and one actually that I happen to share, is the fact that we've achieved public safety by, by locking up and involving millions of Americans in the criminal justice system, which is an unfinished half of the public safety war. That the great, the larger tragedy to me of New York becoming safer is not that some people can't afford to live in Tribeca, it's the fact that we've got five million people involved in criminal justice, which feels to me like a far more pressing problem for, for our our crime concerns. Now, I just will say one other thing. This is such an amazing street, right? Because at least I think Wikipedia is actually right on this one, that it is the oldest thoroughfare in the island of Manhattan. It was a Lenape, uh, Lenape path. It was an area that was fancy in the early 19th century that went through a long period of decay uh, and then has come back. But when I see that, I can't help thinking it should be taller. You should be able to deliver a lot more apartments on that, on that area instead of these tiny buildings. They could actually do more to make this area more affordable. But that's, that's just me. <laughs> I agree with you, by the way, about the criminalization of the population. I think that's the other side of the story, and I think that's very, very, very significant. Can you, in, in, in your work, um, David, you talk a lot about this concept of the right to the city, and, and it, it is one I have to admit I've struggled with. I think it's, it, it's not a capitalist concept. It, it's not one that comes out of the training I've had. Or, um, can, you, can you just talk about what this means, the right to the city? Well, it's, it, you know, the, the right to the city is what we call and technically a kind of empty signifier. It just depends who gives it meaning. Uh, clearly, uh, the rich have a right to the city and can exercise that right because they have the economic power. Uh, other elements in the population don't have as much economic power and therefore find themselves circumscribed in what they can do and where they can be. And uh, uh, there is an attempt, I think, uh, on the part of many organizations uh, to put together an alliance of, uh, of, of social movements in the city that are trying to exercise a certain right to the city in terms of both influencing what political power is going to do, but also uh, trying to, to sort of open spaces in the city where they have uh, a, a presence and can open up possibilities for affordable housing in areas which are, at this point, uh, excluded. And I, I feel like I'm trying to translate <clears throat> the idea into my training, which feels like trying to speak Yiddish with Chinese words or something. It doesn't quite work. But I is it saying the city should not be seen as a bunch of discrete private properties that, that are owned however they're owned, but the city as a whole is a thing that the citizens? Well, I look on the city as a, as, as, as a sort of commons, if you like, which is uh, something which we've all helped create and something which we're perpetually involved in creating and through our daily activities. And as, as a commons, it should be managed as a commons by, by collectively by everybody who, who contributes to the production and reproduction of urban life. And what we see, in fact, is a city that uh, where most of the people who are producing and reproducing urban life have very little say about the qualities of that life and what the city might become. So how, can we just use this block? Because I do, I, 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 so, so I don't know what it was, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, there was CBGB's, yeah. there was a few CD restaurants. Someone somewhere along the line closed CBGB's, built this hotel. How would that work in a right to the city in a commons way? How, how would those decisions have been made? Well, the decisions right now are made by, you know, somebody looking at a block and kind of saying, look, this is a speculative thing. If I, if I procure the property in this block, I can actually then clean it up, get it going, and make a lot of money out of it. And so that's the main aim. And if there are people there that need to be displaced, I mean, there's quite a lot of displacement around in Chinatown 
and it's creating quite a bit of, uh, uh, of unrest. Uh, and, and again, what happens is that poor people get you know, forced out. So instead of that, you kind of say, well, all right, well, maybe we should have a collective kind of possibility of taking over buildings of this type, kind, kind uh, turning them into, say, limited equity co-ops where people can live uh, in perpetuity without uh, necessarily having to face rising rents or anything of that kind. I mean, it's a, it, there, there are various strategies in which you would start to think about how, uh, in, this, in this area in particular, uh, you, could, you, you might be able to mobilize the whole communal force in such a way as to appropriate a neighborhood and turn it into something uh, radically different. Now, the interesting thing about this is I know several European cities where people have done just that, and they've protected areas from the developers. The result is that that turns out to be one of the most interesting neighborhoods in town. And so you suddenly what find would be the, an example? Uh, the San Pauli district in Hamburg, for example, where the developers got hold of almost all of the harbor front and wrecked it, as the developers do. And there was an anarchist movement which, which actually got the kind of kept the uh, squatters squatted in this whole area and, and produced a, a rather, rather beautiful, vibrant area with lots of art. Now the developers are coming in and buying up single houses and advertising them and saying, you can live in this incredibly interesting, diverse neighborhood where all of these interesting things go on. But they didn't create any of it. In fact, they wrecked it in much of the rest of Hamburg. So there, there is an interesting way in which asserting the right to the city is about trying to maintain a space in the city where something different can go on, where collective decisions can, can be made in such a way. It's kind of almost like an autonomous argument that, 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 you, that that, that, that the collective auto autonomous uh, activities can actually transform a neighborhood. And we've seen history of that happening and has happened in the past. Ed, I can tell yeah, from your body language you love this idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just the, the rhetoric seems so similar to me that the rhetoric that was used in the formation of the Greenwich Village Historic Preservation District in the 1960s. I mean, if you go back to those founding documents by very well-meaning people who were trying to preserve the creativity of the Greenwich Village that they had and say no to the developers as well as say no to the wrecking balls wielded by Robert Moses, um, what that ended up producing was a place where townhouses started at eight million dollars, right? And hedge fund managers only can apply to live in most of the, of the housing in the area, your parents ex accepted. Um, so I, I, have, I have trouble imagining sort of the, the idea of saying, saying just no, of just preserving as being a, a viable solution for long run affordability. Um, I think those things are, are desirable. I think certainly the city has, a, has an appropriate role in land use planning that does in fact try to push back on making sure that every storefront doesn't become a bank. I think that's, that's an entirely appropriate use for, uh, for city power, but it needs to be carefully done. And I, I think certainly one thing that we'd like to make sure is whenever you talk about a public project on an experimental basis to take something over and turn it into a limited equity uh, a cooperative, I'd like to make sure that we both agreed that we, were not, that we were not sanctioning the state's use of the power of eminent domain to do that that we were not going to give, say that the state ha has the right to use the power which it is so often abused to actually expropriate private individuals and use it for its own purposes. I'd, I'd love the state to use eminent domain to acquire all the foreclosed <laughs> housing and then turn them back to the people. I mean, that would be a great way to go. And in fact, yeah, some municipalities have actually proposed that. Except of course, the more enthusiastic we are about eminent domain, the more sure we can that it will be used I, for purposes I, I, that I, you I don't like rather than purposes that you do like. Well, the fact is it's being used for purposes I don't like anyway. Indeed. So it's Indeed. not as if I'm going to encourage Indeed. it by actually using it Indeed. in the other direction. It breaks my heart to end this conversation, but we do have a hard stop. And because I feel like we are so close to everyone total closure, agree, total <laughs> agreement <laughs> and closure on these very simple issues. Um, so I, I, I really do want to thank, this has been so much fun for me to just watch this conversation and, and, and be able to take a part of it. So um, I, I just want to thank you guys so much and, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>